All right. Please open your Bibles up to the Gospel of Matthew, please, chapter 9. This morning we're going to continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew. One of the things we looked at last week was Jesus was talking about the idea of how <clears throat> you can't you can't combine the old into the new. You can't weave them together. And he talked about the wine skins and how you can't put new wine in old skins. He was talking about the old compared to the new, the old covenant compared to the new covenant, the idea of religiousness compared to the idea of mercy and grace and forgiveness. And so as we move forward in this study, in this chapter, um, it's a very important lesson, uh, sewing a new uh, piece of cloth onto an old garment. He used that as an illustration, too. The beauty of this is that what Jesus is saying here and what we were talking about a little bit last week was all the things in the Old Testament that foretold his coming, all the things that look forward to Christ's coming, all of the ceremonies, all of the practices that they did, and there were many. And as the years went by, there were many that were added that weren't necessarily originally uh, instituted. And so the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious-minded folk, they were really sticklers about some of this stuff. And Jesus is trying to tell them, there's a new day right? The shadow is no longer. The real thing is here right now. And we can embrace that in Jesus Christ himself. Now, as he's continuing on in this study, we're going to pick this up in verse uh, 18. Verse 18 says, while he was speaking these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him, saying, my daughter just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I can touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he said to her, when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and he took her by the hand and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all the land. This is such an awesome, awesome portion of scripture. We've seen week after week here as we're going through Matthew, these wonderful miracles that Jesus has been performing um, healing people, casting out demons, all different types of wonderful things. And it's all being done for one reason, to prove that he is God in the flesh, to prove that he is the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. And, you know, it's interesting as we look at our scripture this morning because he healed many, many people. And this story really, it stands out so clear um, there's a lot more information about this. If you would like to maybe just flip over uh, to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5, I want to look there also because this gives us a little bit more uh, factual information, if you will, concerning this event that took place. So we're going to pick it up in uh, Mark 5, verse 21. 
This gives us some interesting things that I just want to point out to you as we're going to kind of flow through here. It tells us that Jesus had come back from Decapolis area where he had cast out the, the legion out of that man. And they came to the other side, I'm assuming, back to Capernaum. Uh, and when he crossed over by the boat to the other side, great multitudes gathered by him. And behold, one of the rulers... Now, Matthew tells us it's a ruler. Mark's a little more specific. This is a ruler of the synagogue. This is like the pastor of the local church, if you will, in Jewish terms. And there was a synagogue in Capernaum. You can actually see the ruins of it when you, if you go there to, to visit, which I've never been, but I've seen pictures of it. I'd love to be able to go see it in person. But this, le this leader, this religious leader, Jewish religious leader, comes to Jesus. Now, later on in the gospel is we're going to be learning about what happened to Jesus and uh, how people turned on him. We're going to find out that it was the religious leaders that turned on him. It was the rulers of the synagogue that turned on him. But this leader here, this particular leader of the synagogue, has a serious problem. He tells us, Mark does, his name is Jairus. And as he approaches Jesus at this moment, he falls to his knees before the Lord. Now, when I look at that, I think to myself, here's a guy who's probably dressed in some awesome Jewish robe, signifying that he was the ruler of the synagogue, and he's kneeling before Christ. He's desperate. He's begging the Lord to help him. Now, Jesus knows everything in the future. He knows what's going to happen. He knows who's going to turn on him. You know, if you knew someone was going to betray you and turn on you, and they came up to you two weeks prior to that, and they wanted something from you, but you knew what they were going to do down the road, how would you respond to them? Would you say, hey, look, I'm not helping you out, dude. I know what's going to happen in a couple of weeks, and you're going to turn on me. So don't come asking me for help. Aren't you glad that's not the heart of Jesus? Aren't you glad that the love of Christ can even penetrate the strongest religious of spirits? It can penetrate through all of that and bring true desperation. What did the man have left? You don't read very much in the Bible and the Old Testament about people getting healed. You don't read anything like what's going on here in the Gospel of Matthew with Christ and his ministry healing people like he did. This man really had nowhere to turn. He was desperate. And so he comes to the Lord and he kneels before him and he, and he shares his plight with him. He saw him and he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly. Those are two powerful words, especially when you consider who's doing this, especially when you consider the man who's doing this. He's begging him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she might be healed and she will live. To me, this is amazing that this Jewish ruler has this faith that Christ, because he's seen it. He's been watching it happen in Capernaum as Christ has been ministering there. He's actually seen it happen. And so he knows that if anyone in the universe can help his daughter right now, it's Jesus. He lays all of that religiousness aside, all that legalism he lays aside, and he comes humbly and explains to Christ what his problem is. I love this because Jesus doesn't say anything to him derogatory. He's not judgmental towards this man. It just says that immediately he went with him. He followed him, going to his home to be with this daughter and to lay his hand on her and, and, and heal her. And remember, this is a man of great importance, great stature in the community. I bet you a lot of the people, the multitudes that we know that are hanging around Jesus right now in this story, if you can see this in your mind, they're probably really blown away when they see this synagogue ruler come up and kneel before Christ. That's powerful. 
kind of what was going on. And of course he's a man of importance. And I can almost see in my mind that as Jesus is beginning to walk towards the house, people are making a, a way. They're opening up a path for this important man and for Jesus to get to the house to heal his daughter. And I'm sure that all the people in the community knew his daughter. We also learn from Mark that she was 12 years old. She was only 12. Just a young gal. So as they're moving towards Jairus' house, they're interrupted. They're interrupted by one of the lowest individuals that could possibly ever interrupt this procession, if you will. On the same level of lepers, in a way. It's a woman. And this poor woman has an affliction. She's bleeding. And she can't stop. And you know how long she's been bleeding? Twelve years. That's a long time. And in that culture, when you found yourself sick or you know, having problems somehow with your health, you were considered to be unclean. Think about that for a minute. You weren't allowed to go to church. You weren't allowed to touch anybody because if you did, you would make them unclean. She was totally rejected from her community. And I'm quite certain that this synagogue ruler, who was probably her pastor, had rejected her also. And so as they're going to to this ruler's house, she kind of creeps up from behind. And she's thinking, what can I do? I know if I can get his attention. I just know that he can heal me. What faith she has. And again, I'm sure that she's desperate. The thing that struck me here was the difference in the approach. Whereas the ruler of the synagogue approached him face on and bowed before him, which was very easternly, uh, you know, good manners in a sense, showing honor to him. This woman, she didn't even feel worthy to even get in his view. She didn't even feel worthy to approach him. But she was just as desperate as this man was to receive healing in her body also. She believed that Jesus could heal her even though medicine could not. Now we have an interesting thing that goes on here. Um, Luke, Dr. Luke, he records this story also. But when he records it, he doesn't mention the fact that she went out and spent all of her money on doctors and medicine and it didn't help. He doesn't put that in the record. I don't know if that's because he was a doctor or what, but I thought that, kinda, thought, thought that was kind of different. Um, let's stop and think about it. This poor woman, I'm, you know, I mean, we're, we're grown-ups here. She probably had a really serious female problem. And that's what made her unclean. And in that culture back then, you know, it was very, very quiet. You didn't just talk about things like this. She must have been very, very uncomfortable. And secondly, this this hemorrhaging that she had, again, as I mentioned earlier, no one would touch her. No one could come near her, almost like a leper, lest they would become unclean. So what can she do here? She's got this guy of authority, and he's going with Jesus, and who is she, right? I kind of think that sometimes we feel like that, too, you know, when we're approaching the Lord. You know, there's so many much more important people around. Why would Jesus even want to take the time for me? You know, it seems like he might have bigger fish to fry. But we're going to learn in our story this morning that that's not the case with the good shepherd who heals. She couldn't talk to him. She couldn't get his attention. She couldn't ask him to touch her because that would have made him unclean. But she knew from observing that that's what he did with people. He would touch them and they would be healed. But she knew for her that that wasn't possible. And so she says to herself, if I can just touch the bottom of his cloak, 
I believe I can be healed. And that's exactly what she did. And the scripture tells us that instantly she was healed. And I can imagine at this point, she tried to kind of fade back into the crowd, hoping maybe she hadn't been detected, hoping that maybe he didn't notice. But that wasn't going to happen that day. In Mark's record, in verse 30, Jesus realizes he says something very, very interesting. Jesus immediately, look at this, immediately in himself he knew that power had gone out from him. That's amazing to me. He sensed that healing power that came out of him. And he turns around and he says, who touched my clothing? Who touched my robe? And his disciples, of course, they're just being realistic. You know, Lord, you got... 5,000 people hanging around. They're all groping on you. They're all pressing you. They're all wanting to, and you're asking us, who touched you? And Jesus said, I felt power come out of me. I felt virtue flow out of me. And he turned around, and he saw her who had done this thing. And the poor lady, she's trembling. She's terrified. She doesn't know if she's in good hands or bad hands. She doesn't know if she's going to be turned on, stoned, or whatever. She doesn't know what's going to happen. And he turned around to see her. And when he sees her, fearing and trembling, and she came and she fell down before him and told him the whole truth and nothing but the truth. She told him about her desperation. And he told her, he said, daughter, I love that. Even in her condition of being that unclean like that, you're my daughter. Even in our condition of being unclean like that, we are his sons. We are his daughter. And he loves us and he accepts us. And he says, your faith has made you well, as Mark records that. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So this is an awesome story, that this woman is delivered finally after 12 years of suffering. Now, I'm not sure about the correlation here, but there is a correlation. There's 12 months in a year. There's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 apostles. The girl is 12 years old, and the woman has been having this hemorrhaging problem for 12 years. It's just amazing to see how all of these things are brought together, not by accident, not by coincidence. And so as this event takes place, someone approaches the Lord and the ruler of the synagogue, and they say, don't worry about bothering the Lord now, because she's gone. She didn't make it. She's passed. And Jesus, was he discouraged by that? Was he thwarted by that? Did he give up because of that? Absolutely not. He just looked at Jairus and said, hey, do you have faith to believe? Yes, Lord, I do. I do have faith. I do believe that even in this situation that seems like there is no where to go with it, I believe that there is a way with you. And so he came to the ruler's house. Now, back in the time of Jesus, they would actually hire people to come in and mourn over a death of a family member. They were professional mourners. They would pay them. And we've seen, maybe you've seen on on the news, on TV at some point, how they how they respond in that culture over there to someone's death. They truly do wail and freak out and scream and cry. They make a tumult, if you will, over the person's death. And this is what Jesus approaches as he's coming up to this man's house. All of these people, and they're normally women, that they would hire to do this, we're all making um, 
mourning for her. Now, it's interesting because some people would say, well, maybe she wasn't dead. Well, Luke tells us in his gospel that she was dead. And he is a doctor. And he says that these people were mourning over her because they knew she was dead. And here comes Jesus. He comes into her, into the room. And, you know, he says, what are you guys doing? What's the big deal here? She's just sleeping. She's just taking a nap. And the Bible says here that they laughed him to scorn. They disrespected him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. And you know what? That's what the world does. That's what the world does when we put our faith and our trust in Christ. We might get mocked too. You know, I believe that Jesus can heal me. I believe he can heal me in my spirit, in my emotions, in my body. He can make me whole. And people might look at that and go, oh, come on, what's the matter with you? You know, we're, we're in the 2000s here. Come on, get real, you know. They might mock you. They might make fun of you. And they're doing that to the Lord himself, mocking him, making fun of him, if you will. And you know what he does? He put them out. He removed them from the house. He kicked them out. And you know what? A lot of times before God's going to work in our lives, there's things that we got to kick out. We got to kick out doubt. We got to kick out fear. We got to kick out some of those things that would hinder us from coming and receiving our healing from Him. The doubters. Sometimes you have to change even your friends and the people that you hang with because they'll mock you. They will doubt. They will try to lessen your faith. And Jesus, knowing that, he put them out. He just got them out of there. He says, make room. This girl's not dead. Let me in. She's not dead. She's sleeping. And it tells us in Mark, in the the account in Mark, it says, when the crowd was put outside, then he went in. He went in there and he took Peter, James, and John with him and the father and the mother of the little girl. So you have five people plus Jesus plus the little girl, seven people in the room. Again, a a significant number if you're into numerology in the Bible, a very significant number. Now, amazingly, he touches her. He touches her, and he says, rise. And, you know, it's interesting to me that the words that he uses uh, are actually recorded in the accounts that we have in the, in the Bible concerning this, this young girl. He says to her, Talitha kumi. It's beautiful. I think that sounds so cool. Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. He is actually calling her spirit back to her body because she truly was dead. She was just as dead as Lazarus was when he called Lazarus' spirit back to his body after three days And you remember what the crowd said, Lord, don't don't open that stone. Surely he stinketh, right? He's been in there a few days. And the Lord called back this man's spirit and, and told him, rise, wake up, live. And the same thing happens to this young girl. And it tells us that this wasn't a process, It wasn't a thing that happened over time. It says immediately the girl rose and she walked. She got right up out of bed and started walking around. And it it kind of blows my mind here because the first thing the Lord tells them is, she's hungry, get her some food. 
The poor girl's got an appetite. Give her some food. And he also tells them as he's doing this, he says, I don't want you running around telling everybody about this. <laughs> what if that happened to your daughter? Especially with social media today, right? You mean to tell me that you wouldn't, you wouldn't really want to put it on social media, what a great blessing it happened? You want the whole world to know. But you know, I think Jesus, what he's doing here, it's not that he doesn't want people to know. Everything that he did in his ministry had perfect timing. And he knew that there would come a time when he would pronounce this loudly. When he would literally publicize who he is. But at this point, he's just quietly going around, ministering to people, reaching out to those who are in need. And so the little girl rises, which is such a beautiful, beautiful story. You and I have experienced that very same kind of a thing. We were dead in our spirits. We were separated from God because of our sin, because of the illness of sin, terminal illness of sin. But yet the Lord forgave us. He literally rose us up from the grave and gave us new life. That's what we were celebrating here this morning. <clears throat> the fact that we have new life in Christ. The fact that we can put our faith and trust in Him this morning. And again, I had mentioned this earlier. Does Jesus heal everybody that's sick? Do you know anybody that was sick and they didn't make it? We all do. Because that's kind of how life goes, you know. We come into this life, we grow old, and one way or another we're going to exit, right? You know, I like to tell people, nobody here is getting out alive, right? We're all headed the same direction. So why are some healed in our stories here and some aren't? Well, I believe it's because Jesus is doing it for a specific reason. He's doing it for the same reason that Peter and uh, John do with the lame man in the book of Acts. When, when Peter tells him, he says, I don't have any money to give you. Because he's sitting there begging for money. He says, I don't have any money. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And, he, and Peter reaches out and he grabs him by the arm and he pulls him up to his feet. And the man starts walking. Now, do you think there were other lame people around? Probably. You know, this was a time when they didn't have a bunch of medicines and they didn't have the technologies that we have these days for health reasons. A lot of people had disabilities. But this particular man was going to be made an example of, if you will, for Peter to show everybody he had the very same Holy Spirit healing power that Jesus Christ himself possessed. Because the Spirit of Christ lived in him. The Spirit of Christ lives in us. And he makes a comment here I find very interesting in this process when he says your faith has made you whole. And I want to address that for a second. Because I think it's really important that we understand what's going on here. There's a lot of talk about faith. There's a lot of talk about putting your faith in faith. There's a lot of talk about if you just think positive enough. If you just confess it positively, positively enough that God's going to do what you're telling him to do. You know, there's a lot of religions in the world that hold to that philosophy, to that theology, if you will. All kinds of mysticism religions. So what was it? Well, he says it was their faith. But this doctrine of faith that has crept in to the Christian world, this idea of a positive attitude, your belief that it can happen will make it happen. 
Well, if you have any experience at all in this area, you'll know that that doesn't always hold true, does it? Just because I want it to happen doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just because I have a good attitude about it doesn't mean it's going to change it. Oh, yeah, New Age, metaphysics, Eastern mystics, they believe that way. And unfortunately, it's crept into the church also. Now, I don't have a problem with faith. I don't have a problem with being positive. But my faith and your faith is only as good as what you put your faith in. And if you're putting your faith in your ability, your human ability to be positive, you're limiting God, really. You're kind of putting him in a box. And you can't put God in the box. How many of you know that? He wants to be out of the box. He doesn't do everything the same way every single time he does something. A good example is the lepers. One of them he touches. The other one he just spoke to. He didn't need to do it the same way. When he healed blind people, he did it differently in different situations. And the, and the, and the sad thing about this is when we see this, and we want to put him in a box... This is the methodology that you have to use. Well, here I have a story of a leper, and Jesus went up, and he touched him, and he was clean. So I'm going to start the church of the touch me's, right? I mean, you're really not going to get healed unless Jesus actually comes and touches you. And then there's the other one where Jesus just spoke it, and he said, I will it, be clean. And they were clean. So the, the I will it group's going to say, well, you don't have enough faith because you require a touch, but we have a lot of faith, and all we do is we just let God will it, and it happens. So you got the touch me's, and you got the touch me nots. The first church of touch me's, right? I mean, it's crazy, but that's what happens. That's how these divisions take place in the body of Christ. You know, basically... Most churches, we believe basically the same foundational things. So what separates us? Methodology. It's got to be done this way. This is the way we've always done it. Well, maybe God doesn't want you to do it that way anymore. Maybe he wants to break the mold. Maybe he wants to do it a different way. And it's very important that we allow him in our lives to do that. Let him be out of the box. Don't let our human ability hold him back. It's got to be much more than just a positive confession. It's got to be much more than faith in faith. You know, the, the, even the synagogue ruler knew. He came and humbled himself before God. He knelt before Jesus. He humbly was desperately asking the Lord for help. When we get that way, when we finally break free from the restrictions of this methodologies that we all have experienced, then we can truly see God work. Then we can really see his hand moving in our lives because he wants to be free to do it his way, not my way, not your way. And I know this morning that if I put my faith in myself, I'm very limited. If I put my faith in an organization, I'm very limited. But if I put my faith in God, and I put my faith in Jesus, there's no limits to what can happen. Amen? Amen. I think that's a very, very awesome thing for us to consider this morning. So as this is going on, now the Lord is really, really busy, isn't he? He's over here doing healings. He gets in the boat. He goes across the lake. He casts out all these demons. He comes back over to, you know, to Capernaum, and he's surrounded by people, and now he's healing, and whew, maybe the day is coming to an end, and, and they leave, and they're, they're heading out. And in Matthew, back in chapter 9 in Matthew, Verse 27, it says, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men were following him. 
Now, these guys aren't about to give up. They probably saw him come in on the boat. They probably followed him up to Darius' house, and now they're following him again as he leaves. So he's leaving Darius' house, and I believe he's headed towards Peter's house. He departed from there. Two blind men, they're following him, and they're saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And verse 28, when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are able. I believe because I've seen you work. I believe because I know that you are God in the flesh, that you're all-powerful. Anything you will can come to pass. That's why we've been following you around. You kind of wonder, how were they able to follow him if they were blind? Right? Especially in the big crowd. You think they'd kind of get lost. And Well, I wonder if their friends were helping them. I wonder if their friends brought him to Jesus, like in the story we saw a couple weeks ago. How important for me and for you to be that person. There's a blind person. He's searching for Jesus. He's trying to follow him. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how. Maybe I can help him. Maybe I can direct him. Maybe I can take him to the Lord. That's the privilege that we have as God's children, to share that with other people who don't have that relationship with God, those who are blind. And Jesus asked a simple question. Do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you believe I'm able to forgive your sins? Do you believe that shedding my blood was sufficient so that you would be acceptable in my Father's eyes and that you now will be able to dwell with us for all eternity? Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. He said, I believe. And then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. Now, this is interesting because their faith, this word here, faith, it's a verb. It's not a noun. It's a verb. According to your faith, according to what you have done in order to get yourself in this place right here at this moment, you have to act upon it, don't you? You can't just sit back and say, yeah, I got faith. And it's just going to fall from the sky or whatever. We have to act upon it. We have to, we, have to, we have to be people of action. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe it because I'm pursuing you with everything that I have. Because I believe that you're the one. And their eyes open. And here again, Jesus said, see that no man knows it. Shh. Keep it between you and me. Really? I can see. <laughs> yeah, can't you see him running through the crowd, man? And people are going, hey, aren't those the two dudes that were blind? Wow, check them out, man. They're, they're running through the crowd. They, they, they can see. Verse 31, when they departed, they spread the news about him in that country. And as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man who was mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. Amen. It was never seen. You know, we've never seen anything like this. In all the hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years of our history, we've never seen anything like this. Who is this man? And here right away, and you kind of wonder where Darius is right here in this situation because it's the Pharisees now who pop up. It's the Pharisees who are standing there watching this happen. It's undeniable that this mute is now speaking, that whatever spirit that was in him has been cast out by the Lord. How do they respond? Instead of being humble and praising God for his goodness and his love, what do they do? He casts out demons by the ruler of demons. 
Now, that in itself is really stupid. It doesn't make sense. And, of course, Jesus addresses this in another place where he says, you know, that's impossible. Because a kingdom that's divided against itself cannot stand. So if Satan's casting out Satan, then he won't stand. It's just logic, isn't it? It just makes sense. That's one of the things I love about the Gospels and, and the teaching of Jesus. It's so logical. It makes so much sense. Don't try to d- diminish what the Lord has done. He has set this man free. He hasn't been able to speak. And we've seen in Scripture already how many strange things happen to people in the Scripture who have this demonic problem. Some are deaf. Some are blind. Some have physical deformities. Some have antisocial behavior. Some are physically destructive to themselves. They have mental problems. And in in this case, mutinous. Now, does that mean everybody that's mute has a demon? Well, no, absolutely not. But the Scripture is very clear to tell us the difference between a person who is sick and a person who has a demonic issue. And Jesus deals with it the same way. I don't think it was any harder for him to raise up Dryas' daughter than it was for him to cast out that demon. You know, Jesus said, what, what, what's the deal here? You know, remember the man they lowered down in the house there, and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And everybody went, who in the heck is this guy forgiving sins? Only God can do that, duh. And he looks at them, and he goes, so what's harder? For me to say, be healed or your sins are forgiven? Well, let me show you. Be healed. And the man gets up and takes his mat and leaves. There was no challenge for the Lord. He didn't have to, you know, rev himself up a little bit more to get the demon out than to heal the sick. Right? Sometimes we see that. You know, sometimes we see that with people. They think, okay, this is a big one. I really got to get pumped up for this one. And the Lord's saying, just relax. Just let me do it. If you allow me to do the work, I will deliver that person. I love it because, you know, even as he said when he went into the little girl's room, he said, make room. Get out of the way. Get all the doubt out of the way. Because if you want me to do great things, then you got to move all that doubt away. This is kind of at the pinnacle of Jesus' popularity here. As we've seen, multitudes are following him everywhere. In verse 35, we kind of get a synopsis, actually, of his ministry. It says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The Lord touched the people and healed them. We don't know how many. It says every disease, every sickness. Could you imagine what it was like for these people who, their lives are hard. They didn't have the modern conveniences that we have today. Everything was a struggle. People didn't live very long back in those days. And and actually, they looked very insignificant. They're just multitudes of people. They're just sick. They're just going to die. You know, no big deal. But you know what? That's not how Jesus saw it. He saw them as valuable. He saw them as precious. And the scripture tells us that when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He wasn't being critical. He wasn't pushing people out. He was a good shepherd. He was filled with compassion. I love that about him. He looks at us this morning. And as he looked at this crowd, they looked like sheep without a shepherd. They were just trying to get through, meandering through life. And the Lord had compassion on them. And the Lord has compassion on us. He sees us the same way this morning. 
He looks upon us with the same love and the same compassion. And in verse 37, he turned to his disciples and he's probably pointing at the crowds. He says, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know that same burden is going on today. I read something recently, a statistic. It said 10% of the people in a church do 90% of the work. It's true. It's true. But you know what? Just because that's a statistical fact doesn't mean it has to happen here. It doesn't have to be that way in our lives. We can beat the odds. We can say the harvest is truly great. And we do need to be helping. We do need to be part of what's going on. These people to the religious leaders, they were probably just a burden. They probably just were getting in the way. They were probably scattered. And there is a solution to their problem. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And I'm the good shepherd, and I will lay down my life for my sheep. He's not in it for what he can get out of it. He has the best interest of his sheep at heart. And I want that kind of care in my life, don't you? I want to know that the Lord has my best interest at heart. No matter what I go through, no matter what life hands me, I could still know the Lord is with me, even that song that we sang earlier. He's never going to leave us. And he looks out and he sees these people, and in his eyes, it's a a harvest. But you got to have people to go out and participate in the harvest. I think that speaks, you know, not only to us personally, but I think that speaks to us as a church also, as believers. It should speak to every church. I have heard motivational speakers, manipulative methods. I've had people send me books on church growth, how to raise money, how to be a positive speaker, all this kind of stuff. And I think to myself, you know what? All we need is the Word. We just need to teach the Word. We just need to love people. Let God do it. He's the one that has the plan. So, you know, you get the email and says, well, if you'll send me $29.95, I'll send you a book on how to make your church grow. I don't need to send them $25.99 or whatever, you know. We got the Holy Spirit. We got the Word of God. We got the freedom to say, Lord, you can work outside the box in our lives if you wish. Right? Why don't we have our worship team come back up? So just in closing this morning, we have seen amazing things in the last few chapters. And this is a very powerful challenge for us this morning to take stock of our own lives. And, you know, I see... uh, Lonnie and Chris meandering over to the area over there. If you need prayer this morning, go visit them. Maybe you're interested in serving. Go get some prayer about it. Begin to pray. Maybe you feel like, man, what, where, where can I help? Where can I be a part? How can I invest? We'd love to have you do that. Because Jesus said, remember when we were having communion? I'm the vine. You're the branch. And if we're plugged into him, we're going to bear much fruit. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful word this morning. Thank you, Lord, that in 2,000 years you haven't changed a bit. But that you look upon us the same way you looked upon those multitudes. 
that you have the very same compassion, the heart of the good shepherd who lays down his life for the flock. Lord, I just pray for our church right now. Every one of us in this room, every one of us that aren't here today even, Lord, that you would just touch us with your spirit. Lord, that that fire in us would be kindled. That, Lord, we would begin to see the urgency of the time. That it's short. Help us, Lord. Empower us that we might do your work and your will. And bring glory to you, Lord. That's our heart this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
setting sun. His love endures forever by the grace of God. 